evening. Hello, good evening. Welcome to the Lafayette Library and Learning Center. I'll try again. Hi, thank you so much. Good evening. My name is Sarah Blumenfeld. I'm the Development and Program Director with the Lafayette Library and Learning Center Foundation and your host tonight. I'm so glad to see so many people here and so many fans. Um, before we begin, I want to just share a couple things with you. We have a very special tour coming up in June. It's of a place called Oliver Ranch. It's in Sonoma. And Oliver Ranch is a private, world-renowned sculpture collection home to over 18 site-specific installations. Uh, tickets are now on sale. There's information on our website, and there's also will be a flyer outside before you leave. I had the pleasure of doing this tour five years ago. The work is remarkable, and it's really fun to have a docent-led tour where you hear all the great stories about the pieces and how they were made and the artists and, and how they were brought in. Um, Oliver Ranch is a private um, place owned by a particular you know, family, and they donate these tours to nonprofits as a way to raise money. So it's not something you can go and see without doing a special tour like this. The other thing I wanted to share with you is that we have Lisa C. coming on June 27th. We'll do a very special tea on Tuesday with Lisa C. on June 27th, and that will be out in the next couple weeks. I want to thank Arenda Books, our bookstore partner that does a lot of marketing for us, as well as donating generously to books that are purchased here tonight. Um, also, the proverbial, please silence your cell phones, everybody. Let me let you know about that. Um, a lot of the books have been signed, but if you would like to have it personalized, you'll have a chance to do that after the program. Um, Alka will be outside at the desk next to uh, Arenda Books, and she'll be uh, very happy to chat with you, personalize your book, or sign it if you didn't get a signed copy. So tonight we welcome New York Times bestselling author Alka Joshi. She was born in India and came to the United States at the age of nine with her family. She has a BA from Stanford and an MFA from California College of the Arts. Her debut novel, The Henna Artist, quickly became a New York Times bestseller and also was a uh, Reese Witherspoon book club pick. It's been translated into 26 languages and is currently in development with Netflix. I know I will be watching. <laughs> the sequel, The Secret Keeper of Jaipur, was released in 2021. And she shared with me earlier that this book is actually the first one that she's been able to come and do book talks with because of COVID, so she's very excited to be here. Tonight, she's here to talk about The Perfumist of Paris. Alka will be in conversation with Mary Vollmer. Mary is the author of two novels. She earned her MFA in creative writing from St. Mary's, where she now teaches, and she's also a spiritual advisor for their athletics, which I found very interesting. Um, please welcome Alka, Josie, and Mary Vollmer. I hope everybody uh, park their car okay in Lafayette, downtown Lafayette. Oops. <laughs> well, welcome again to uh, another event that I was been looking forward to for weeks. As soon as I knew that Alka Joshi was coming to town, I, I was very excited to have any kind of part in this. I've been following the novels since the first one came out, and the opportunity to rejoin this cast of characters was just irresistible. Now, I was looking for a quote that might kind of start us off, and I found a quote from that great literary master, Albert Einstein, who said, human being experiences herself, excuse me, Albert, her thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. And I thought this, this is one of the reasons why I love this book, because it forces me out of my very limited perspective into the mind of someone else from somewhere else and reveals the deep humanity that I had only known in snippets and pictures before. So please 
allow me to welcome, let's give another warm welcome to Alpha Gashi. He's bringing these characters to life. Now, this is the, the third novel of a trilogy, and if you have a chance to buy all three, they are all three for sale out there. How did you come upon Radha as a character? Because it occurred to me that you may not have loved her in the first book. Lakshmi has a difficult relationship with her sister when she arrives on the scene in, in her life. Yeah. Um, I wanted Lakshmi to have a sister. I wanted her to have to take care of somebody in a way that she hadn't before. Um, so yes, when Radha shows up, she's only 13, and she wants an older sister. Well, Lakshmi's not having any of that because she feels that Radha needs to learn all the rules of society, all the 33 rules that she has come up with, and she thinks if Radha only knows those, she'll be successful. Uh, so Radha thinks, hey, I don't want to be treated like a little sister. I have been raising myself. I want to be the adult here mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so they have this, you know, combative relationship. And I think as we were talking, I, um, I was thinking, the first book, The Henna Artist, has me thinking from, Ra from Lakshmi's point of view. And she finds Radha irritating, so I find Radha irritating. <laughs> and it wasn't until Mary pointed out why I have now come to empathize with Radha in The Perfumist of Paris is that now I'm in Radha's head and I'm writing from her point of view. And so as I'm doing that, I'm like, I'm thinking, oh, okay, I, I think I understand now how hurtful it was for Radha to give up that baby um, in the first book. Um, so it's been an interesting evolution from the first book to now having Radha be this grown up. Um, and I feel like the whole thing sort of came full circle. Mm -hmm. And in the sandwich in between there is Malik, just because he's so insistent on having his voice. He's so, he's so, he's so charming, he's so lovely. I, like, I fell in love with that little guy. So he had to have his own book because, you know, he told me he had to have his own book. So, that, <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how the trilogy came about. When your characters tell you, you listen. Eventually, eventually. You yeah. Listen. Well, the first book, begins with Radha's voice. It wasn't until I was looking back that I realized it has really come full circle and Radha now begins this yeah. third book in the trilogy. And you know why that is? Um, when I initially wrote uh, The Henna Artist, and you know, it took me 10 years to get it to the point where uh, my agent would send it to a publisher. But during those 10 years, um, I was developing the two voices, mm -hmm. Radha's voice and Lakshmi's voice. Uh, and so every alternate chapter had either one or the other in it. Well, uh, my agent said, you know what, it's not working. Uh, when you have two first person voices, each of them has to be as compelling as the other because if they're not, uh, the readers will know and it's not gonna work. So uh, I said, okay, well, you know what, I'm gonna work on Radha's voice, her chapters, and I'm gonna make them equally as compelling. And I sent them all back to her, and she said, it's not working. I said, no, I'm going to show you. I, I did it all again. And uh, she said, OK, it's still not working, so you, you have two choices. You have to eliminate all of Radha's chapters, or you have to eliminate all of Radha's chapters. <laughs> no choice. So finally, I just, you know, it's like separating an arm from your body. You've worked so, so, so hard on this uh, uh, writing that it really hurts to take it out. But I had to cut out all of Radha's chapters, and that's 140 pages. So then I had to go back through the novel and insert uh, places where I can show what Radha's doing, but not from her point of view, from Lakshmi's point of view, which actually made the, the book so much better. It made it tighter, it made it better, and um, I hate to say it, but yes, my agent knew exactly what she was talking about. <laughs> Well, you have a very good agent then who can read a book and know exactly what it needs. Yeah. The, well, then, and it wasn't wasted because no. here we are three books later with, with, yeah. with Radha. Yeah, so that's the coolest thing. So in the first book, The Henna Artist, my agent had said, why is Malik even in this book? It should be just about Lakshmi. And I said, well, he has to be there because he is Lakshmi's um, uh, sort of right-hand man and he knows her better than anybody else. She doesn't confide in anybody else, but he sees all of those secret parts of her life. 
Um, and uh, my agent said, well, if he has to be in there, then just minimize his appearance. So I cut all of these parts of um, Rup Malik out of that book. And so sure enough, when I finished that book, he said, now you've got to you know, put all of my parts together and give me a book of my own. So that's, that's how that thing came about. Is it too early in the conversation to ask who else you've cut down to? <laughs> who else we might, we might expect next? <laughs> Uh, well, and, and each of these characters have their own particular talent, their own particular way of seeing the world. Lakshmi is so very practical. She's a survivor. She just knows how to get uh, moving forward, and, and Radha is not. She's an esthete. She senses the world through her nose and chases her desire. So how, how did these two sisters emerge in two so very different books and two so very different landscapes? Yeah, um, I think... Uh, that Lakshmi is very much a product of the earth. You know, she, she uh, gathered so much information about herbal mm -hmm. um, remedies and uh, what it was like to work the earth with her mother-in-law to do the gardening and grow these plants. And um, so she is much, much more earthbound. Mm -hmm. And I think Radha is much more like if you go up into your senses, she is much more uh, ethereal in that way. You know, she, she, uh, she smells things, she feels things. Uh, she is much more, I think, of a left brain kind of person. So um, it was only natural for her to go into perfume because she was so good at mixing um, Lakshmi's henna paste and she made it finer and silkier than even Lakshmi could mm -hmm. do, and Lakshmi admitted that. So um, when I realized that, that Radha was going to elope, of course in uh, typical Radha style, right. she elopes uh, to Paris, doesn't even tell Lakshmi where she's going, uh, with Pierre, um, it was only natural that in this land of uh, fragrance uh, in France, the perfume capital of the world, that she would end up in that mm -hmm. industry. Are you, do you have a strong association to smell? Um, I think in the way that we all do, you know, when we smell something that brings up a memory for us, because smell is so associated with memory, um, you know, I will think of a moment, um, you know, in my past that I can associate that with. And the, it comes up just like that. It comes up so fast. And then you know, you know, that was bath time with oh. my mom, or that was... Uh, that was the way that it was when I was 15 and, you know, at my first dance party. These, these things do come up for you, so I think that's the way that I think of scent. Do you have a, a first, a smell that's coming to mind now? Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> I think uh, my first memory would be my mother braiding my hair and um, she would put oil on it. So, you know, she would wash my hair and then she would put this coconut oil on it and, and uh, then it would be tamed enough so that she could make braids. Oh. And, and I love that, that whole association is not only the smell of coconut oil, but it is the touch of my mother's uh, uh, hands on my head. So don't answer this question. You can say it in your, but what, what is that? Same question to the audience. What, Smell is very tactile, something that brings you back into memory. Just hold it for a minute silently. Yeah. And think about that when you're reading this book and, and, and seeing how closely Radha moves through her world through the sense of smell. Yeah. Um, these two landscapes, so in the first two books, we're in India. Mm -hmm. We're immersed in this, in this luscious and sometimes poverty-ridden place. Uh, and now you've moved us to another locale that has equal importance in Paris. Mm -hmm. How did you reconstruct this landscape with such care? And I think we can walk in Paris in some of those yeah. roads. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm going to find the cafe that she has, has she visited. So right. how, how did you do that? What was your process? OK, so I knew that Radha was going to go into the creation of perfume because she knows how to mix ingredients together. Um, I know she's in Paris. And, uh, but I don't know anything about perfume at that time when I first started writing. So I was talking to the producer of the Henna Artist um, TV series. You know, there's a Netflix uh, series in the works. Mm. And I said, Michael, I need to find out about perfume. And he said, um, oh, I know just the person. Her name is Ann Gottlieb. She's in New York City. 
and she will tell you everything she knows because she is the force behind Jador and uh, CK1 and Eternity and all of these. And so I called her up, and uh, at first she didn't pick up my calls <laughs> uh, for a couple of tries, and I am nothing if not persistent. Uh -huh. So uh, she finally said, okay, I'll see you, but you have to come to New York City. So I went to New York City and met with her, had lunch with her mm -hmm. and a master perfumer whom she brought along. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she got me into one of the biggest fragrance labs so I could see the kind of place that Radha works uh, as a fragrance uh, lab technician. Um, and uh, then, then the master perfumer she introduced me to said, now you need to go to Paris and talk to some master perfumers there. So I flew to Paris, I talked to the master perfumers there, and they said, now you need to go to Grasse in the southeastern part of France, which is known as a perfume capital for many years. And so I went there, and I went to a fragrance factory, mm -hmm. I went to a bottling plant, um, and really got to know the whole uh, industry uh, front, front to back. And then they said, now you need to go to Lisbon because there are a couple of people there that you should talk to. Wow. So I talked to a boutique perfumer there who's a young Indian woman who is uh, wanting to bring out uh, her own line of perfume with a lot of very clear um, Indian scents uh, to them. And then I spoke to Yves de Chéry, who is a, um, uh, he comes from a family of perfumers. Mm -hmm. For 200 years, their family has been making perfume. And he is now 85 years old, and he had um, uh, been in the perfume industry in Paris in the 1970s when the book takes place. So the book takes place in 1974, which was the first time I went to Paris, which is why I remember it so clearly, oh, okay. and I wanted to describe it. Okay. Um, but uh, in any event, so um, Eve uh, told me a lot about the perfume industry and super helpful about the 1970s because it was a really hedonistic time, you know, in a lot of people's lives. It was coming at the heels of the 1960s and um, there was a lot of partying going on and <laughs> a lot of bed hopping going on and some of that made its way into the book. Um, and, uh, and then uh, what I decided is that I would really need to be in Paris and figure out where Radha is living. Hmm. So. I found the exact apartment I was looking for in my head. Uh, she and Pierre lived in one of those old apartments with the wood beam ceilings and the uh, hardwood floors. And um, they would have those tall windows that you always see in Woody Allen movies. Um, and, uh, and then they would um, have a, th a fourth floor walk up type of situation. Uh, and I found the exact apartment I was looking for on Airbnb, so I booked it for two weeks. <laughs> I know, you know, the life of a writer this is really, really <laughs> tragic. This is, <laughs> this is why I don't uh, do any writing about the New York City sewers, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I stayed in this apartment for two weeks, and what I did was I would write, and then I would leave the apartment, and I would think, okay, where is Radha going to get her coffee? Where is she going to get her baguette? Um, uh, how far is it to her girl's school? And, and you know, these are like real places that I'm putting in the book, so I better know how she's going to get from one place to another. So I write all of that into the book. I weave all of that together, and the delight is when uh, somebody who knows Paris really well reads the book and goes, oh my God, I know exactly where you are, and I know exactly you know, where to go from there. You're saying everyone here should buy the book and go to Paris, <laughs> right? That well, let's, let's shift just a little bit to the story itself. Because you've got this fantastic character. She's 32 years old. She's got this promising career, but yep. she's got a secret. Yep. So what, and, and, and this secret, by the way, is, is established in that very first book, but you don't have to have read the first book to right. really know what's going on. So right. how did all of this, how did the, the plot of that first book suddenly emerge as key to this story? Um, I think that in the first book, when uh, Radha becomes pregnant with Lakshmi's, um, uh, the son of Lakshmi's biggest patron, mm -hmm. um, I think that she really doesn't understand the gravity of what has happened and how she ruined her own uh, older sister's career uh, to the extent that her older sister has to move away to mm -hmm. a, a whole different state, a whole different town, and start all over again. 
Um, I think that she never actually paid the price for it, mm -hmm. at least not from Lakshmi's point of view or from Kantha's point of view or any of the other folks who were around um, Radha at that time. And I think in this book, part of what I'm trying to do in The Perfumist of Paris is to hold Radha accountable mm -hmm. for what happened to her. But an interesting, hap interesting thing happened. While I was in her voice and in her inhabiting her body, and writing her story, I understood the depths uh, uh, to which she actually did feel the loss of that baby um, whom she gave up for adoption, um, the extent to which she did understand what impact it had on her sister's life. Mm -hmm. um, it's not interesting, it's like, it's like she, look, she's a fictional character, but to me she feels really real. Mm -hmm. And when I inhabit these characters' lives, I, am inhabiting how they feel, how they right. react. Right, um, and we are too, through, through the book. Yeah, yeah, so, so that's kind of how um, it started. I wanted her to have this reckoning, but in having this reckoning, I think that uh, we realize there's a lot of other issues that are going on in her life that are also needing some reckoning. Right. And then she has the opportunity to create perhaps her own fragrance line, which is unheard of, especially with a woman who hadn't even finished her chemistry degree yet. Right. But one of the other central characters named Delphine, who knows what it's like yeah. to be in a man's world doing, a, doing this job, has a lot of faith in her. Now, I, I do want to know about the perfume, but I am really curious about Delphine. Okay. And how she came to be into the book. She seems really very right. tangible and real to me. Right. So this is an example, you guys. I know that as readers, just like when I read something, I think, how much of this is real? How, how much of this is made up? And where did all of that come from? So Delphine Silberman, who is uh, Radha's boss in this book, uh, is actually modeled, um, or actually, uh, yeah, modeled after a real woman that Yves de Chiry told me about, uh, named Sophia Grossman who lived in Paris and was working in the perfume industry in the 1970s. Sophia smoked like a chimney. <laughs> and I said, Eve, how could a woman who smoked like that be able to work with perfume? Because I thought that you know smoking uh, took your uh, sense of smell yeah. away. And he said, I don't know, but she is the force behind so many perfumes that are mm. still sold today. She would have one hit after another. <laughs> and so Delphine, in the book also, she smokes like a chimney. Um, so this is kind of like where, where different things come from. And you know, you mix a little bit of fiction with a little right. bit of fact and um, make that happen. Oh, right. But yeah, so Radha has an opportunity to create her first scent. Delphine gives her that responsibility. Radha doesn't want to screw it up. And she has a really clear idea of, of what scent she wants to create. So here's how all this comes about. Okay, so a little bit of fact, a little bit of fiction. So when I was in Paris for the first time in 1974, I went to something called the Jeu de Pomme, which is no longer a museum. But the Jeu de Pomme had a big impressionist show. And uh, one of the paintings there was uh, with Edouard Manet, and it was called Olympia. Hmm. And uh, I remember it had an impact on me. Well, all these years later, I'm trying to think, what is Radha going to create? And I think, you know what? Mm -hmm. She's going to create a fragrance for the model in Olympia. Um, so I started doing research on this, uh, this painting, and here's what I find out. Uh, the model in that uh, painting, her name was Victorine, and she was a painter in her own right. In fact, she was admitted to the Paris Salon before Manet was. Hmm. But she was not wealthy the way Manet was, the way um, uh, Renoir was, the way that uh, Monet was. Um, and so these men could just spend all of their time painting pictures. Uh, Victorine didn't have that luxury, so she was a model in order to survive, um, you know, pay her bills and so on. But Victorine is long forgotten. And yet, you know, the painting survives and Manet's name survives. And in that painting, Victorine is looking straight at the viewer. Um, this is something that had never been done before. You always had these women who were looking off to the side, looking down, very demure, or, you know, like, don't look at me kind of thing. Um, and she is looking directly at the viewer as if to say, take me as I am. 
So Radha now is creating a perfume for this woman. She goes at, day after day after day, she goes and looks at this painting to see what this woman is about. And she realizes, I need to create for a woman who is bold and not afraid to be who she is. Mm -hmm. So that is how um, her assignment gets started. She's almost complete with her formula when she realizes she's missing one key ingredient. So she calls up Lakshmi. Lakshmi, I'm missing this one key ingredient, but I don't know what it is. And Lakshmi says, you know what? We need to go to Agra, to the house of the courtesans, because they know how to seduce through scent, and you are missing something that I bet they are going to know um, everything about. Mm. So that is how uh, Radha then goes back to her roots, goes back to India, um, meets up with Lakshmi, and by now the sisters have um, a very uh, nice relationship, a very symbiotic relationship with one another, because Radha has grown up a lot. Right. Um, and uh, they go to the house of the courtesans in Agra, and sure enough, Radha finds the fragrance that she is missing in her formula. She comes back to Paris, and there is Pierre sitting on the couch as soon as she opens uh, the door to their apartment. And next to him is Nikki, the grown-up Nikki, uh, who is now 17 years old. I know, I had that same reaction too. I'm like, oh my God, he's sitting there. Um, and uh, <laughs> and he, um, he has found all the letters that Kanta yeah. has been sending to both Lakshmi and to Radha. Uh, telling them, oh, here's a picture of Nikki as he's taking his first steps. Here's a picture of Nikki playing cricket and graduating from high school and so on. And uh, all those letters were returned unopened mm. by Radha. And he found this whole bank of letters and he thought, who is this Radha? Why is she getting all of these letters and not opening them? So that is what he has come to Paris to mm. find out. So scent really brings her physically back to the place that she needs exactly. to go to find herself, not exactly. just in our minds, which to the rest of us, we're, we're yeah. lingering in. Yeah. I and mean, when she goes back, uh, I mean, the whole landscape of perfume was amazing to me. I had never, maybe I don't have a very good nose, but I, was, I, I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't aware that there was people who can smell 2,000 different scents and name them. I yeah. think maybe 10 I'm capable of. Yeah. So when she goes back, though, she visits this place that has a long history yeah. of creating scents. And you, there's, a, there's a section in the book. Yeah. That just really vividly brings that to life. Would you be willing to read it to us? Oh, yeah. I think it's one, we were, we were talking about one of them. I have it, if you don't. Yeah. So um, this is the one where um, she encounters uh, the fragrance yes. factory in Agra for the first time. Yeah. Um, it turns out that the fragrance factory uh, it, that the courtesans run also is producing scents that are not yet known in France. And this is actually real. So one of the scents that they are creating uh, is something that can only be found in India because it is uh, formulated after the monsoons have come. Hmm. Uh, so uh, even in France, they did not know about this particular scent until about 20 years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I found that fascinating. So in this, um, Radha has gone to... So your um, book predates the actual discovery of yeah, this? Oh, yeah, interesting. Ac actually. Cool. Um, so Radha has come to Hazi's fragrance factory, and Hazi is showing her around the, the fragrance factory. The door to the back alley opens, and a man walks through it, pushing a wheelbarrow filled with cow pets. He upends the lot in a corner of the room <laughs> next to a larger mound of similar cow pies, just as I'm about to turn my attention back to the essential oil, I see two of the workers using large buckets to scoop the cow dung into the copper vessel. The worker at the hearth stands and places both his hands on the metal pot. He seems to be testing the temperature of the water inside the vessel with his palms. In Kras, the workers would be using a temperature gauge. I watch, fascinated, wondering why are they cooking manure? As if she's read my thoughts, Hazi says, it's not cow dung, it's soil collected after the first monsoon rain. Patty is made of soil? I walk over to the pail of essential oil and tap the worker on the shoulder. He steps aside to let me sniff it. Hi, Bhagwan. Suddenly, I'm back in Ajar, seven years old, my hair hanging in a messy braid down my back. The monsoons have come and left the earth bleeding water. 
I'm stepping out into the open area in the back of our hut to look at the sky. Patches of blue fight for space amidst pregnant clouds. On the ground in front of me, the three metal pails I'd left out overnight have filled with rainwater, which means I won't have to fetch water from the farmer's well for several days. Huh. Steam rises from the ground. The air is dense with tiny particles of water that haven't yet been dried by the weak sun. I spin in a circle. I let the drops wash over me. All around me is the scent of promise and potential. What Ma and I could grow before the sun bakes the soil. The clothes I'll wash today and hang to dry will use this energy, this possibility of making something new. Ma is behind me, kneading dough for the chapatis. Her eyes haven't clouded over yet. The scent of atta merges with the scent of my surroundings, creating something moist and sugary, an earthy fragrance. Hazi is grinning at my reaction. This Radha is the scent of rain. Oh, wow. And this is the scent. Yeah, hello, Kraken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, that was beautiful. It was even, I remember being just stopped and going back and rereading some of these sections because they just bring you so clearly into a scene, both the, both the grown-up Radha, but also her childhood. I talked to my dad about this. I said, I said Dad, do you remember this? He goes, absolutely. Oh. It's, uh, it's called Mithi Ithar. And uh, uh, see, see, the Indians in the audience all know what that means, right? And uh, mitti means uh, soil or dirt, uh, and ither is like atar, you know, what you've heard of as essential oil. So, yeah, all Indians know about this scent, um, but the French didn't learn it until years and years and years yeah, later. very recently. So she goes here, but she, when she returns, of course, her, her, her long-lost son, Nikki, who she's told nobody about, not her husband, not her, her current children, not her mother-in-law, right. um, is, is, is here. But he's also bringing up kind of a central conflict within Radha's life that I think a lot of women even now could relate to. Yeah. So how do I become, be a mother, this deep and meaningful thing, but also pursue a vocation that is part of me that without which I would be, I would be half a person, I would not be a whole person. And there was a section in here I just read and reread because it, the conundrum was just so clear. I want more for myself, she says. I'm a bad wife for wanting more. I love Pierre and I want us to be happy. I resent Pierre for not understanding me or even trying to understand me. I love spending time with my daughters. I'm conflicted when I have to spend time with them and cut into my work on the Olympia project. I like when we're all together as a family. Sometimes I wish I lived alone and had no one <laughs> to look after. And I think you were narrating my life in that, um, <laughs> in that section. But also in that section, she is starting to come to terms yeah. with this, this key dilemma that I don't think has ended and may never end. Mm. But how did you find, I mean, you are a woman, you don't have kids, but right. you, you understood this so deeply. Yeah. Um, you know, over the years, I've had friends who have shared this dilemma with me, and, um, you know, I still hear all about these kinds of things. You know, when I go to events, women will just come up to me and start talking to me about these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is a challenge for us still. Radha's dealing with it in 1974. She loves her work. She's ambitious. She wants to. And good. Uh, and good at yeah. it. And, um, but she has two daughters, and she loves her daughters. She loves spending time with them. But her husband would really like her to spend all of her time with the daughters, stay at home, and not work. And I think part of what he's feeling is a little bit of shame uh, in, that other people will think he can't support the family. And I think a lot of men over time have felt that way. Um, uh, I remember my dad. Uh, when he, we came to the United States because he wanted to get a PhD in uh, civil engineering. Oh, okay. And almost uh, as soon as he graduated with that degree, there was a glut of engineers in the 1970s, and he couldn't get a job. And my mother looked around and thought, oh my gosh, I've got three kids, and they're all going to be going to college in three or four years. I have to do something. And she went to work. She had no, she was like Lakshmi, you know, as mm. you know, she was my inspiration for Lakshmi in the first place. 
Um, but like Lakshmi, she didn't have any skills. She didn't have any uh, anything that would you know give her a white collar job. So she went to work in a factory, and she was soldering motherboards together for those big IBM mainframes. And I remember my father having been so educated, he was embarrassed to have a wife who was um, doing blue collar work. Um, and so I, I, I think you know part of what he was feeling, and I you know I I sort of I absorb what he was feeling, which is um, I should be able to provide for my family. That was a whole thing about coming here uh, to the United States, and I can't. But um, you know my wife has to go to work. So I think I'm you know I'm trying to capture some of what happened in my own family with what Pierre is feeling. Um, but you know a lot of women today. 50 years on are still feeling the same thing, right? I want to be home, but I also want like to work. Please don't leave me at home for 24 hours a day. I will probably go nuts. Um, and by the way, I'd like some more help at home. And how do I get more help without feeling like I'm nagging? Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. how do I not nag, but just assume that there should be a natural part of a sharing at home. I should do half and maybe he does half. But uh, we all know that you know that's not reality, and I wanted to capture a lot of that. Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a line in the book where she's saying, "It's 1974, and we're still dealing with these things." I just, <laughs> in the margin, I just have ha. Huh. <laughs> like, that's oh man. Well, when we were speaking earlier, you were talking about. And, and as you're speaking just now, I'm thinking, well, how, how did she do this? How did she write this book? And you were talking about the importance of listening as a writer. Yeah. The importance yeah. of being able to hear not just what you assume, yeah. but what someone is um, suggesting with, with what they're not saying. Can you say more yeah. about that? Yeah. So, um, you know, to answer that, I think I have to tell you, I was a really, really, really shy kid. Oh. And I could not talk to people. Uh, if I had to stand in front of anybody and talk, my heart would hammer so loud in my chest, and I would think, oh my God, you know, they can probably hear this, and you know, I, I couldn't get a word out of my mouth. So um, uh, I think that because of that, I learned to draw, oh. and I always drew things, and I drew things mm, the way that I wanted life to be, and um, I developed you know, a real talent for art, and I thought, oh, I'm going to grow up to be an artist. But what art teaches you to do is to observe really carefully. So you observe, you know, the crow's feet around people's eyes. You observe what their face looks like, but what they're, what's coming out of their mouth is different. Hmm. Um, you observe whether the trees have leaves on them or whether um, they're going to remain bare for the rest of their lives because that's the end of their life. Um, so I think I learned to observe. And then when I got into writing, when I was 51 and in a, uh, an MFA program where I learned to write, um, it was just a matter of transferring that observational quality uh, to uh, my writing and to be able to communicate on words what I'm seeing in my head. Mm. Well, it makes sense. It's a very visual book. I can often see the places that, that she's um, going through, moving yeah. through. Yeah. Um, what about marketing? You were doing marketing for years and yeah. years, and, and, and that too, you think, has made you yeah. the writer that you are? Yeah, um, I think that what marketing and advertising taught me, well, first of all, you know, when you're writing commercials, whether it's TV commercials or radio commercials, you're writing a little story, a tiny little story that only lasts for 30 seconds or a minute. And that story has characters, and it has a plot, and it has dialogue, and then uh, you've got to shoehorn uh, the client's product or service into it. You know, so from 30 seconds to 60 seconds, that's a lot of stuff to do. And it was uh, such a pleasure to be able to spread that minute out into 300, 400 pages. <laughs> and I didn't have to sell a client's product or service. So, um, so I, I think advertising taught me a lot about, um, you know, really compressing a story. And um, then also what advertising teaches you is that uh, you have a lot of deadlines and you have yeah. to meet those deadlines, you know, because you're constantly on one project and another and then you move on and, and then something else is in production and so you're constantly uh, moving around. 
Um, and there are deadlines when you're a writer. You know, your editors want the work at a certain time, and you better be delivering. Mm -hmm. um, I think another thing that advertising um, showed me or prepared me for are revisions because there's no way that your very first idea is gonna be accepted by the client. They want to see three, four, five ideas, and then they wanna be able to tell you none of those are exactly right, so you need to go back and do five more, and so hmm. you always have those in your hip pocket, by the way, uh, so you don't have to start all over again. So you were prepared when your agent then said, no, you have to cut 140 yeah. pages. To go yeah, on. yeah, yeah. You learn that your work is not so precious. Ah, yeah. yeah. How do you know when it's done, then? I, you know, I don't know, Mary. I just always know when you it's do. done. I just, I get to the end and I go, well, that's, that's done. Huh? Huh? Yeah. Is she lying? Do we know anything? <laughs> <laughs> um, but your um, editors and your agents uh, sometimes really want you to do a little something different at the end. Um, I remember with uh, the henna artist, I had a very different ending uh, before my editor at um, HarperCollins got a hold of it. And she said, okay, so each of the characters in your book are good, bad, and, you know, they're evil, they're whatever they are. But th it's a mix, right? Just like we human beings have everything in us, so do my characters have everything in them. Nobody is just good or just mm -hmm. bad. She said, but Hari is all bad. <laughs> and, uh, and the way that you have written him there is nothing redeemable about him. And I said, yes, because I hate Hari. <laughs> I don't want him to be good at all. And she goes, okay, that's pretty clear. Um, but as an author, you really need to um, get all of your characters to have that third dimension. Yeah. And so she said, can you just take another look at him? Well, I didn't want to. So it took me like three months. I was so stubborn. And finally, I just said, all right, okay, so what can I um, do with Hari? And I had to ask him, why are you the person that you are today? And I, and I learned from him. He said, you know, I was raised to think that I was God's gift to the planet. I am a, an Indian male in India. <laughs> I love my Indian sisters here because they're like, yep. Um, but, uh, you know, I, you know I'm, a, I'm a guy. I get to do everything I want. I'm the first to the table. Uh, you know, if I want a glass of water, somebody brings that to me. And so if he wanted uh, Lakshmi to do something, uh, you know, if he wanted to bed her, then she should be willing. And she wasn't willing. She had her own ideas about what she wanted her life to look like. So um, then he got really upset with her. And then the gossip eaters came in, right? The village gossip eaters, they were like, um, you know, what kind of a man, uh, you know, has a woman who hasn't given him children in the first couple of years? Uh, so mm -hmm. then he gets really upset with her, and then he finds out that she's deliberately keeping herself child-free, and that puts him over the edge. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, okay, I, I, I got it. And so then I started weaving that part of his life into the book that you read today. And uh, the way that it originally ended was that Samir was standing at the platform, and as the train was leaving, he um, uh, reached in through the window and gave Lakshmi back the pocket watch that she had left behind um, you know, on the counter. And then as I was going through the book again, I thought, oh, that's the wrong ending. Hmm. This really has to be Hari standing on the platform hmm. and saying goodbye to her in that relationship that wasn't successful. And she has to do the same to him. And this will bring them that kind of ending to that part of their life that they really needed. Hmm. So that's an instance where um, uh, my editor didn't say change the ending, but she said, think about this character and what else you could do with the character, and that changed the ending. Right, and you were open to that. You were yeah. able to kind of then go into that layer of Eventually. And, and, and eventually, <laughs> eventually. Well, it occurred to me, too, reading about these women and how that they are taking some control of their lives is that feminism actually allows her first son, Nikki, to do what he is made to do. Yes. He he would not have been allowed to do what he does. And I won't maybe we won't tell them what he does in yeah. case they haven't. Uh, no, she's saying no. no <laughs> Don't <more>. spoil it. <laughs> um, but but in that case I think their ability to make a new space for themselves allows 
her son to make a space that otherwise wouldn't have been allowed for him under the yeah. strict patriarchy of, yeah. of India. I think what we're seeing uh, also here is the generational changes that uh, happen over time. From the first book to the last, um, 20 years have gone by. And uh, you're able to see, I think, much more in the younger generation. Um, these are Radha's children and Malik's children um, and somebody else's children whom we won't name. Um, but that whole generation is able to be um, more uh, forceful, uh, more able to say this is what I want and this is how I'm going to go about getting it. Uh, and I think every successive generation, I think, gathers more and more of that yeah. courage. And yet, with Radha too, to find what she wants, she has to go back. She has to go back to those roots that she left yeah. behind to really become fully who she was in this yeah. new place. Yeah, and okay, so this is really interesting because a lot of people ask me, if you haven't lived in India since you were nine years old, how, do, how can you write these novels? Well, it's sort of like Radha, right? Mm -hmm. Radha goes to Paris, but she has never given up her roots. She right. still remembers everything about being uh, seven years old and having her mother uh, put her hair in braids. And you know, just like I remember those things from my first nine years of my life, mm -hmm. I remember what that was like. I remember uh, the humidity, I remember the heat, I remember going to Shimla in the summertime with my family because it was so hot in Rajasthan, we needed to go to, up to the mountains. So, you know, these things never leave you, right? right. Just like uh, with Radha, her upbringing never leaves her. And uh, going back to India, she feels all those feelings of um, being a young girl again, or um, of having those moments in her life where she uh, loved, uh, you know, being in a certain environment, right. being with Lakshmi, being with Malik, being with her mother. Right. When, what was her nickname? She has to kind of, she goes back, but she has to kind of clean herself from this nickname that, that, the, that the gossip eaters gave her. What was that? Was yes, the, uh, she was the bad luck girl. The bad luck girl. Right. And she seems to carry this with her to Paris. Yeah. She puts it in her backpack. She carries it home. And then, uh, you know, it, it's not an easy thing for her to let go yeah. of. Yeah. There is a reckoning of that sort that also happens yeah. for her. You know, how long is she going to carry this chip on her shoulder um, about being the bad luck girl. When can she get rid of that? Um, how can she become uh, you know, more of herself without getting lost in um, the family and family um, obligations and yeah. so on? I mean, how do you let go of the things you've been branded? Um, and how many times do we assume that those are actually our names, those brands that we carry? Yeah. Do you have another section for us? I do. I love this um, this section. Um, so this is um, Radha has. You know, this is interesting. I don't even know how these things happen. <laughs> but in uh, the henna artist, Lakshmi has a very sympathetic mother-in-law, the one who taught her uh, about herbal healing and so on, and uh, and she loves her mother-in-law and has a very good relationship with her. Well, in the perfumist of Paris. Radha has a very contentious relationship with her mother-in-law, um, sort of, sort of in that same sort of, uh, you know, how Radha is always sort of rebellious, and yeah. you know, she she's not going to have that happy relationship. So um, she and her mother-in-law are in a conversation together, um, and I'm not going to tell you exactly why, but um, I think the the reason I'm reading this is for something, some other reason. She's quiet. We listen to each other breathe. Finally, she says, two days ago, I told Pierre that after you returned from Agra, you seemed different. I don't think it's just because Nikki showed up. It goes beyond that. There's a settled feeling about you, in you. It's as if in India, you found a piece of yourself you had lost. Mm. There it is again, the idea that we women lose track of ourselves. Lakshmi always said henna was a way for a woman to find a part of herself she may have mislaid. Sheila said she wanted to bring the forgotten women back to life because while their painted images were famous, the, men th the women themselves had been forgotten. They'd been discarded like candy wrappers tossed on the ground. Is that erasure of us something other people do to us 
or mm. do we women do it to ourselves? Wow. She's asking all the questions that I have. Yeah. <laughs> We have about 10 or 15 minutes left. Um, there must be some great questions in the audience. We have a mic back there that will travel to you. So just raise your hand and it will arrive magically. <laughs> Hold on one second. Did I wear this jacket to match the book? Was that the question? <laughs> So I'm curious, you mentioned that you had an agent before you got published, so how did you get an agent when you were uh, not a published author? Oh, uh, really good question. How did I get an agent um, when I wasn't a published author? Um, well, I went to school at CCA, California College of Arts in San Francisco, and um, I cherry-picked my classes. There was an instructor there, her name is Anita Amirezvani. And I loved this book that she had written called The Blood of Flowers. And I thought, I'm going to make that woman my mentor. Mm -hmm. And for four semesters, uh, while the two years lasted, um, she was my mentor. And I worked on the henna artist with her. Um, and uh, even after I left school, I kept working with her. I hired her to um, help me uh, flush it out some more. And after I was at about eight uh, drafts of it, I said, Anita, would you please send this off to your agent? Because if your agent liked your book about 17th century Iran and a woman who weaves rugs, I know she's going to like this book about a woman who uh, does henna on people in 1955 India. So Anita did, and I get a call from New York from Emma Sweeney, and she says, I have a manuscript in front of me from Anita. I love it. I love the character of Lakshmi. Let's work on it together. And immediately I think, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to get published. Oh my God, that is, that is just amazing. And, uh, and Emma said, no, you're not getting published. You have a lot of work to do on this novel. <laughs> and that is a good agent. That is a really good agent. And she kept me doing that for about eight, eight years. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I have to keep working on it and keep working on it. And um, I would get so furious with, uh, with Emma sometimes, you know, like I would say, no, there is no way uh, that, um, that I, you know, there, there's no way that I can keep working on this yeah. because there's, I don't know of any other agents who keep their uh, clients hanging like this. But um, Emma kept saying, you're not ready, you're not ready, you're not ready. And, you know, she was absolutely right. If she had let that novel go years before, it would never have seen the light of day. Hmm. It is a far better novel uh, after, you know, after an, uh, uh, Emma's, Emma's input on it. Yeah. We have another question. Hi. Thank you so much for your books. They are so beautiful, and I cannot wait to dive into this third one. I have a question about the caste system in India, and did it change at all from the first book to the, to the third one? Uh, no. Um, so she's asking if the caste system has changed from the first to the third book. Um, this is uh, an interesting question for me to answer because uh, caste system in India has been around for thousands and thousands of years. And you are born into a caste and you don't leave that caste, that, that is your caste for the rest of your life. Um, think of India as uh, two different ladders, the people are on two different ladders. One is a caste ladder, so you have your Brahmins, your Kshatriyas, your, your uh, Banyas, uh, you know, your servant class and then your Dalits, you know, your untouchables. This other ladder is your socioeconomic ladder. So, you know, you're making a lot of money, you're middle class or you're lower income. And these two ladders are different ladders. So you could be down here on this ladder, but you could be up here on this ladder. You could be a Brahmin, but you choose to be a cook and you're probably making this much income down here. So um, the cross-pollination can happen but you don't, you don't change castes. You can change your socioeconomic position. We have a question over here. Hello, I haven't read the books, so I'm looking forward to that. I have a question about the protagonist. In 1974, you've chosen a woman, and it sounds like a woman who's a chemist, um, that moves to Paris, she's a woman, and she's a woman of color. I was wondering if you could comment at that time um, to be a scientist, my father's a scientist, at that time in the 70s to get work as a man of color or an ethnic mm -hmm. man was difficult. So I just wanted to maybe talk about how the power in that. 
Okay, so the question is, um, how would a woman in 1970s uh, Paris be able to get a job in a, a position like a chemist, uh, chemist would? Um, and this is where my research comes in, because my research showed that there were at least three women who were able to break the barrier in perfume. Uh, perfumists are chemists. They have to know uh, how one ingredient is gonna interact with another in order to become a master perfumer. Uh, and many of them spend about 10 years getting to the point where they can be considered master perfumers. Mm -hmm. um, so there were women who broke through that barrier and who were studying chemistry, and they were either doing it at the Sorbonne or you know, one of the other institutions around there. And um, Radha, while she hasn't studied chemistry, is uh, fast on her way to learning all about um, the, the, you know, the chemicals and so on. So there are people who became master perfumers from the chemistry side, and there are other ones who became master perfumers because they had that much experience and they kept learning and learning and learning. So um, yeah, so she's in the latter category. And of course, we know she's super smart, so. <laughs> and another question for you. How much time do you spend in India? And um, over the time since you were a child, what about the differences that have happened in India and the opportunities for women? Um, the opportunities for women and what kind of a change has there been in all this time? Um, so in 2019 was the last time I was in India pre-pandemic, and I made it a point to talk to a lot of different uh, women, young women in particular. I wanted to find out what are they doing, mm -hmm. uh, what are their uh, impressions about marriage, uh, about their careers and so on. And um, the answers are different based on whether they are in a city or whether they are in a rural area. If they're in a rural area, many circumstances remain the same for them. They are going to be married uh, at an early age. Um, they may have some schooling, uh, more schooling than maybe they used to, and, um, but they are still going to be the, the wife, the, um, the child bearer and all of, you know, that'll be their main role in society. They will probably work, just like a lot of um, lower income women have to work in order to maintain their family, um, but they'll be probably working in farms or some kind of a low, low level job. The women in the cities, however, have a lot more um, uh, movement in, from one uh, kind of socioeconomic position to another. The whole middle class in India has grown tremendously in the last 30 years. So that means that uh, parents were able to educate not only the boy child, but also the girl child. And so we have a lot of young women uh, you know, leaving universities with a BA now in all kinds of different um, uh, arenas. Um, and these women were telling me that you know, they will most likely have their uh, parents choose a partner for them um, if they wanna get married. And some of them are saying, I don't want to be married, or I don't want to be married now, or I would rather wait um, you know, to get my BA first before I, I do that, um, or I would rather get my PhD before I start having children. So they're, they're having more uh, ability to negotiate uh, through that whole family structure. Um, one of the interesting things was that uh, some of these women were telling me, you know, 18, in my mother's era, 18, was the cutoff. If you weren't married as a woman by the, by the age of 18, you were considered a spinster. Uh, and now the age cutoff seems to be 28. So when a woman is 28 and not married, the whole family goes into action. <laughs> Everybody has to, has to try to find a partner for her. Um, but, but another interesting thing that these women said to me, you know, 70 to 80 percent of marriages in India are still arranged. And I asked them, why is that? And they said, well, I am so busy um, studying, um, fixing my career, you know, um, traveling. There are all these things that I'm doing. I don't also have time to search for a partner. And that's a full-time job. So who would I trust to do that but my parents? They know me better than anybody. They know whether I like ice cream or a piece of toast. They know whether I like coffee or tea. They know more about me than anybody, so I trust them to find the best partner for me. So um, these are the kinds of things you know, that I have learned. 
Are there any more questions? I'm, you know, um, Indian sisters, if you guys want to contribute to this conversation, you're more than welcome to. Okay, we have another question back here. Now that this trilogy is complete, what is inside you? I'm hoping another book. <laughs> um, let's see, my agent has just sold books four and five. And, um, and so book four, I... <laughs> She sold books four and five. Look, you guys, I feel like I'm living in fairyland. She sold books four and five for seven figures. And I want to thank each and every one of you who has ever bought one of my books. <laughs> so yes, I started working on uh, book four. And uh, book four is taking place in 1937 and it's about a young nurse who is taking care of uh, a female patient who is like the Indian Frida Kahlo. And uh, this painter is mysterious and also uh, fascinating to the nurse. Uh, the, pa the painter dies, the patient dies, and the nurse will spend the rest of the book trying to figure out what happened to her. Uh, and of course, along the way, Feel sorry for me, everybody. Along the way, of course, she has to go to Prague, she has to go to Florence, <laughs> she has to go to Paris, you know, she has to, she just has to go to these places to find things out. So my husband and I are off to all those locations on May the 1st. <laughs> all right, on that note, thank you so much. And um, Alka will be signing books outside. Oh, we have another Thank day. you. <laughs> thank you. I want to. I want to also thank Mary Vollmer, who, yes. who yes, who is a fabulous moderator, and Sarah, who is the one who got me here. Thank you, Sarah.